going to be waiting a few minutes for the uh, rest of the attendees to come back from the networking sessions. My project. Yeah. What so what I do at work basically. Oh no, I meant like how you ended up there. Like Oh how I ended up there. So I um I did a master's in biomedical engineering, um, which kind of led me there, but before And welcome to this afternoon's session of the 2020 uh, WES Student Conference. I'm delighted to introduce our afternoon keynote address from Dr. Ozak Esu, who is the Smart Assets Lead at BRE and Chartered Engineer of the Year 2020. Ozak is an award-winning Chartered Electronic and Electrical Engineer and the Smart Assets Lead at BRE and the Construction Innovation yeah, Hub. Born and raised in Nigeria, she came to the UK at 17 to study for her undergraduate degree at Loughborough University, where she was graduated yeah. with. Oh, so weird. It, does, it says it's been on all this time, but I'm pressing mute. And it doesn't where she graduated with the so first class and was awarded a scholarship to advance to her PhD. She has over six years' industry experience and is a STEM volunteer and engineering ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Ozak and thanks very much for the introduction, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to join you today um, on the West Student Conference. I used to attend these conferences as well when I was a student. Um, I remember going in Birmingham where they had one venue and then in London the following year. Um, today, I'm really fortunate to be invited to speak to you about my career journey. Um, and the hope is that there is something in there for somebody um, and something that to encourage you perhaps or something uh, or perhaps give you a different way to think about your own um, uh, career path. And um, something I always like to say at the beginning as a disclaimer is that this is just my own um, journey. Everybody's path is different in life. That's just the way it is. But I find that by hearing other people's story who have gone through a particular process that I want to go through, sometimes I find things that I could apply to my own journey. I may make it into my own, and I, I do encourage you to do the same today. Don't just try it and do the same thing uh, the same way. Um, but hopefully there will be some things that um, encourage you in yours. I titled my <laughs> talks, um, Strive to Thrive, um, because I was trying not to just say, oh, my journey as my title. And um, strive means to try. And I feel like that's something I really do. I persistently try. Um, and, and thrive means to flourish. So flourish means it's like, it's like a continuous growth. So it's not, it's not ever finished. I don't think it's, it's continuous. So that's, that's why I went with strive to thrive. And um, so I'm going to go right into it and start by talking about my motivation to become an engineer. So I grew up in Nigeria. That's a picture of me um, in high school. Um, and we, I experienced power cuts growing up. Um, we had we didn't have constant we didn't have um, access to constant electricity and still don't. Um, so this this is these are the stages I went through. Um, I used to do my homework with candles with my siblings, and then when my parents ended enough, we were able to get diesel and um, kerosene actually first for kerosene lanterns. 
And then when they end a bit more, they start buying rechargeable lamps, which is what is in red. And they'll take it to their office and charge it and then bring it back home for my siblings and I to do our <laughs> our homework until we graduated to where they were able to afford their own um, private diesel generator. And that's the aspiration goals you have. And we don't have um, constant electricity for many reasons. One is like demand is really high. There's 200 million Nigerians to start with. And then also the infrastructure is not um, it's not updated very often, but very early on, the absence of having like access to electricity, it really impacted my life. Okay, I grew up in a very strict household. We weren't allowed to watch TV. And the only time we were allowed was on the weekends. And that was when there was always power cuts. So it was more the frustration of not being able to watch football or, or cartoons that led me to ask like, who, or who does anything related to power? And, and I was told it's electrical and electronic engineers and that was how I decided that that's what I was going to do. It did help that I was really good at maths. I love mathematics. And I wasn't very good in many things, but it was the only thing that came naturally to me. And um, I struggled with the sciences. So obviously, I got um, help through my tutors to help me improve in physics and never liked chemistry, never good at it. <laughs> I was so bad in chemistry during when I went to college college begged me to choose another subject just so that I don't ruin their records of like ranking. <laughs> That's how bad I was in chemistry. But yeah, I was going to study in Nigeria, in, in Ghana. I knew very early on I wasn't going to go to university in Nigeria because again, we have frequent um, strikes and unrest in the academic calendar. So I was going to go to Ghana to study for my undergraduate because that's where my brother went. Um, but when I went to this college, um, Ghana was going to take me until I was 17. So I had to go. My parents sent me to a college for a year. And while I was there, they were talking about UCAS and applying to the UK. And that's how I got introduced to the idea of coming here and how I came. I decided to apply. Um, I got a place at Loughborough University. Um, but I had to downgrade from the MNG program, which I had applied for, to the BNG program because I didn't make the grades that was required for the MNG program. Um, I, I did my AS and AT in one year and I got three C's um, in maths, physics and geography. So I was just very happy to get a place because I was rejected by my other choices <laughs> or my other choice university. And it turned out to be the best decision because I really enjoyed my time at Loughborough, which I'm going to talk to you about in the next slide. Um, so my undergraduate experience, like I just said, I felt like I came in um, I felt like the underdog, if I'm being honest, like I love for love for his top five for electronic and electrical engineering. Like it doesn't get more better than that. Um, but there was a part of me that kept feeling like everybody else there had A's. Um, I, I was barely scraping the surface with C's. Um, so in first year, being 17, I wasn't allowed in any clubs. So I, I spent most of the time studying because I felt like I needed to catch up. And um, so for me, I prioritized my goal to achieve a first class. And why specifically was a first class? Because my dad said so. It doesn't get any. <laughs> it was because he literally said when he, my, my dad and my mom dropped me off, they said word for word. My dad actually, not my mom. My dad said, if you mess this up and don't get a first class in your first year, none of your sisters are coming to the UK. That's it. So basically, that's everybody's dreams resting on my shoulders, pressure. Um, well, yeah, it helped. I wasn't allowed to go out. So I, I spent quite a lot of first year studying. And then when I was ready to party in second year, everybody was overage because of freshers. Well, I still did party and I, I made lifelong friends. And that's a great thing about university experience and why I would typically encourage people to consider it. Um, there, there's the academic side of things, but there is also the life side of things that I don't think is quite advertised or given as much credit as it should um so yeah made life lifelong friends um sought support um so that's something i was really keen to mention today um the great thing about at, at least where i went to in university i never felt like if i had a problem i didn't have where to go i think most times people don't know about the support that's available to them at, on campus so i would ask you and urge you to find out whether it's finance, you're struggling with your finances for your particular course or, or, or your mental health, or it could be basic things like even referencing. So how you reference for your coursework and stuff. I use all the services, career services, how to write the CV, get it checked by people who are professionals and paid to do this 
on a regular basis and they could give you advice on how you could improve that to then apply for jobs. So I used all the services, but most importantly, and um, was my peers and, 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 and students who were in the year above me. They've done that piece of coursework. They've done that particular lecture the previous year. So they're more likely to know more about it than I going in blindly. And then academic tutors as well. I was appointed a personal tutor and I think most universities appoint one. I'd say form good connections with, with them and actually um, seek their advice whenever you feel like you are struggling with any piece of work, whether it's your coursework or just in general. Um, I caught the volunteering blog, um, blog sorry, um, my dad just meant it was really part of the culture at Loughborough University that we um, get, got involved and volunteered our time. But in my case, it was extremely important that I got involved. So um, I was very shy, very reserved. I didn't, I didn't speak much. Um, and so volunteering was a way for me to start building those interpersonal skills that are very, very important later on uh, in, in your career. Um, and I just enjoyed the idea of meeting other people who were outside of my course. Um, I also joined the Institution of Engineering and Technology as a student member. And not that I'm biased or anything, I am. <laughs> I would recommend you um, consider other professional engineering institutions as well. But for me, joining the IIT as a student member really kind of helped shape some of my, my early journey or my early career. Um, it's a great opportunity to network with professionals in industry that you hope to actually get jobs in. Um, so I joined as a student member and I stayed and I'm still a member of the IIT till this day. I also joined the Engineers Without Borders UK because we had a, a chapter on campus and I was really passionate about um, how we could work and um, we could apply engineering and improve developing countries like where I'm from. So engineers without borders do quite a lot of placements and opportunities, again, which I can only recommend that you go have a look and check out. Um, so I entered competitions and challenges and awards. I didn't win in many of them, but I entered, and that's what I mean by striving. I always try. Um, and uh, I think it is things change for me when I stopped looking at things only in the context of success. So you've done something, you weren't successful in it. The effort you've put in, in that process is also a learning experience. And I think once you start looking at things like that, it's a lot easier to just try and have a go. Um, I applied for, an, um, for jobs, both in internships and placements, but I was unsuccessful. Um, and, and so I started applying for um, a master's program. I decided not to do the MNG program in the end because there were opportunities to upgrade to the MNG program. I decided to stay on the, on the BNG program and just purely because the MNG is not well understood back home in Nigeria, which is where I hope to go and work and I, I, at, the, at a later stage in my career. So I started applying for masters and my personal tutor told me, why are you applying for masters? Why don't you consider applying for a PhD? I remember saying, oh, no, 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 no. That's how they said do an AS and 18 one year. And I ended up with three Cs. And then I was begging everywhere for admission. So I'm just going to go through the normal process. But I did apply for a, a PhD opportunity and I was successful in getting one at Loughborough University. And my PhD was in wind energy and advanced signal processing. So there are um, MEMS accelerometers, microelectromechanical systems accelerometers. They're very tiny like that. And they're found in our mobile phones. And because of the increased use of smartphones, the cost of the sensors have become really, really cheap. So my entire PhD was looking at how we could use those to detect damage on the turbine blade. Um, and it's great because of the miniature size, it doesn't affect the aerodynamics of the blade. The blade is able to function as it should. But then when it's connected to a microprocessor, it can um, alert, uh, it, can be, it can monitor the, um, the health, the structural health of a blade throughout its entire life from when it leaves like the factory to when it's installed and alert like a maintenance system or a maintenance team when a failure occurs rather than them having to shut down blades just to do calendar based checks. So I got to publish and write articles, which I, I was really fortunate for. And the Loughborough University um, provided funding for my PhD as well. Now, when I towards the end of my PhD, I was running out of time. So I, I did my PhD from 2011 to 2014. I started worrying about my finances because my funding was only for three years. I started applying for jobs again. I was getting many rejections for many reasons, but one of the key ones I didn't have um, 
I, I, need, I needed a work permit, a, a visa as an international student to get or work opportunities here in the UK. So I was really keen on getting into the um, energy sector, but I started looking broader and applying to other sectors like um, construction because I noticed not many UK or EU nationals were really applying and there was a deficit and there's theories. And I don't know why, because it's such a tremendous industry, the built environment, so many opportunities. I was fortunate and I got a graduate role with a company called Condo. And as a, a building services engineer, you design electrical, uh, you design um, electric, I was an electrical building services engineer, you, and you design electrical building services for buildings. So how does electricity get to your site? How is it distributed? Your lighting systems, fire alarms, security and access control, and um, control systems for that. Um, and I did that for about four years or five years. And uh, yeah, so Love Profonded, my PhD. And um, while I was writing up my thesis, I started working. So you can see the overlap between 2014 to 2016. I got promoted to electrical engineer. Um, and then I, I finished my PhD. And I started missing the research side of things. and started looking for ways I could link the stuff I did in my PhD around sensors to the stuff I was doing now in my job around buildings. And I really got interested about smart buildings, which is essentially what it says, how we use sensors to improve the performance and collect data within the built environment. So that's what I do now at BRE. BRE is the Building Research Establishment, and it has been around since 1921. So I feel very privileged to be working there and to be able to combine two things that I enjoy doing. Um, I was able to achieve chartership last year in 2019 and through support from like my mentors as well. But it was always an active goal from when I signed up as a student member of the IET in 2009. And so it took about 10 years to get there. And I feel very, very proud about that. Um, throughout my career, I've been fortunate to <laughs> pick up some awards. So some success is not all doom and gloom. <laughs> um, and these are a few pictures of some of them. Um, so the West 50 um, on, on, on the 50 in 2017, which was really, really a, a proud moment for me um, to be <laughs> shortlisted on, on a list with such phenomenal women across the sector. Um, and then in the same year, I think 2017 was quite a, a, a high. I, I haven't experienced that in, in, a, <laughs> um, in a while. Uh, the same year, I won the IIT's Young Woman Engineer of the Year Award. Um, which is that one there in, in the picture. I'm actually wearing the same top right now. <laughs> um, and last year I, I applied for some travel grants because I wanted to undertake a project with um, some um, women from the industry that I had met and made friends with. And we went on an expedition to Malawi where we built a STEM classroom for students at Mangochi um, um, in, in Rainbow Hope School. And yeah, like Elizabeth mentioned, I was also fortunate to pick up the award for Chartered Engineer of the Year 2020. Um, and just last month, I had been shortlisted for the Woman of the Future Award in the real estate and infrastructure category. So this was uh, a nomination from my em current employers at BRE, which I'm really, really proud of. Um, so challenges, are because I've talked about all the highs now, <laughs> and some of the challenges I've faced in my career and, and I still face, so it goes in us descending on that sending. so obviously job hunting and work permit that was really stressful and um, can everyone hear me um job hunting and i just saw a comment saying somebody saying they can't hear um but job hunting and work permits was really stressful to try and achieve and try and attain um i applied for 100 jobs and i got rejections I remember keeping a, an Excel spreadsheet just so that I don't make the mistake to apply to the same company twice. Sometimes it wasn't because of anything on my CV, it's just automatic. And I'm sure some of you would experience this, but I think the key thing is to keep persevering and keep trying. And um, eventually something will happen, but also try and seek feedback where you can. I did ask for feedback often if I made it through to like interview stage because I want to know what I did wrong so that when the next opportunity comes, I can improve on that. Um, so that, that, that's the only thing I will say. In terms of those who are international students and on work permit, it is what it is. I think the only advice I would say is the UK BA, UK Border Agency, they have a list of certified sponsors. Don't bother wasting your time applying to a company if they're not on that list, because it's a lot harder for them to be able to sponsor your visa. So, um, Good luck with that. I don't I don't have any more extra tips on that particular one, to be honest. 
I, I think also the challenge of juggling my PhD and work was really stressful. I remember I had to, I used to go into work at 6 a.m. so that I could start on my PhD, writing up my thesis from 6 till 9 a.m. And then when it was nine, I'd switch over to work stuff and do work nine to five and then switch back again to my PhD from five till midnight and have lunch, breakfast, dinner, everything in the office. And I remember feeling very overwhelmed, sometimes really sad about like or, or feeling just stressed out by the whole thing. And I think something I, at that time I just kept telling myself was that it's for a short time. It's only temporary. It's not always going to be that way. And it isn't that way now. And until this day, I think being able to finish that PhD um, is one of the things I'm proudest of. Um, I think ever since I finished that PhD, I just feel anything is like, oh, it's challenging, but it's it, it, like, I feel with work, I have colleagues, the workload is shared. It's not just resting on my shoulders alone. I have people I could bounce off, but my PhD felt so individual. I don't think I can express that. I will experience that type of weight again. I hope I don't though, but I was really proud of that. Um, but that was a challenge at a certain point. I think I still struggle with perfectionism and, and rumination. So rumination is like when something, you don't do something right, for example, you make a mistake, but then you play over and over and over again in your mind, even when everybody else has moved on from that particular thing. I, I still struggle with that till this day. But the key thing is that I'm aware of it. And I, I'll talk about it in the next slide. Self-awareness is very important in, in your career, in, in, in your life in general. And when you're able to know and recognize things in yourself, it makes it um, slightly easier to manage and, and recognize. Um, emotional intelligence. Woo. I, interestingly, so if you notice the challenges are not technical on these things, right? And that's something I discovered when I started working is more about the interpersonal skills and how you interact and engage with other people within your work environment. Now, emotional intelligence, I'm still growing and I'm still developing. Uh, emotional intelligence is it encompasses many things, but some of it include other wider things like conflict resolution in the workplace and how you handle certain situations, but also how you make other people or you work with feel. And um, some things I would say are essential, essential in like your roles or in your future careers is uh, on the job learning. I know a lot of people, at, at least when I was an undergraduate, I was so worried about not knowing enough to go into the workplace. Thing is, you would never know everything. And back then I had somebody say this to me in a presentation, but I didn't really believe them until I actually went into industry and realized it's an ongoing process, it's a journey. So you're going to keep learning. You cannot know every single thing under the sky that there is in your role. But that's the beauty of it uh, as engineers is that it's changing and you can actually learn and adapt to suit. Um, Self-awareness is, like I said, it links back to what I was saying about emotional intelligence. So knowing yourself, like being knowing your strengths, at least, and your weaknesses. And um, so sometimes I'm able to remove myself from situation and look objectively because I was like, is it because you're, doing this because I know I do that thing. But if you don't know, you just exist in oblivion. And I, I think self-awareness is very important. There'll be training, I don't know, it depends on what companies you're going to work with, but there are training opportunities available, at least in in, all, um, in condo. When I started as a graduate engineer, I had training on these other softer skills and managing conflict and all these other things. The key one is sensitivity to your coworkers. Um, it's very essential in, in, in the workplace. Um, so treat other people how you want to be treated and, and, and create inclusive environments if you want to be included as well. So I don't know, I feel like I, I, I go on the karma system, basically. I'm not an expert in this. I'm just saying what I do. Um, communication, uh, communicating and networking. So whether that's through networks like the West Network right now that you have here, utilize it or whether it's online. I know with COVID, it's a lot difficult to meet people, but um, take, take advantage of opportunities where there are. And these are some tips I've picked up over time. Again, I'm not a guru or anything, but um, experience um, is competence, success plus failure. People forget that part about failure very often. It all adds to our experiences. And sometimes you could use them as examples in like, for example, job, job uh, um, um, interviews, et cetera, because being able to recognize that, yes, I didn't do great in this particular thing, but these are the things I learned it shows that you reflect, it shows that you're aware, um, and it shows that you, um, you're you developing, basically. And um, it shows you're also human. <laughs> um, and another thing is um, if you are working towards professional registration plan, 
record and track your, your development. Gather and keep evidence as you go along. Don't wait till when you actually want to apply for chartership. That's a key tip. Um, if you want to be promoted, now I never forget this one. Don't look upwards. Don't only look upwards at the role you want to fill. It's very important that you also look downwards and make sure there's developed people to fill your role when you move up. So for me, that drives me to share my knowledge and time. And, and it's, it's very self-explanatory, so I wouldn't waste time going into detail about that, but it's really helped me. So being able to share my knowledge and being willing to share my knowledge, because it's not just about upwards movement as well. To move up sometimes, you need people who are also because capable and who are also developed and feel empowered that when you do move up, they too can um, accelerate or, or move a step forward with you. Um, give feedback. Um, so and um, when giving feedback, because I think this is something I had to learn. I'm quite direct with feedback. Like I didn't like that. But over time, going back to my point about sensitivity to coworkers, a tip that someone's told me is this is the key formula for giving feedback. So when you do this, this happens, and I feel that it makes me blah blah blah. I would prefer if you did that. So I don't know, take a screenshot of it because I, I have it on a sticky note in front of my computer. Anytime I get an email and I don't want to reply, I, I just have a look at it again and make sure that I'm replying in that particular tone rather than attacking someone's character. And what next for me? I continue to strive and hopefully thrive in my personal life as well as my professional life. Like work isn't everything for me, but work is important to me. And um, I do have my personal life and I hope to thrive there as well. Continue to collaborate and volunteer my voice and expertise for an inclusive industry and also continue to say yes in, to opportunities that present themselves to me. Um, thank you very much for listening to my presentation and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Ozak. That was very, very inspiring, as you may see from some of the comments in the chat about uh, your journey. I mean, to go from learning by Catherine Lamp uh right if you could just mute the mic actually, Ozak. sorry thank you to go from learning by kerosene lamp and working and studying your phd at the same time and basically working from six in the morning till midnight i think that that's really shows a lot of determination and dedication we have got time for a few questions uh and um i'm going to start by um saying uh, K Cody has asked, how did you record your CPD? Did you start when you first became a student or did you start to look back and organize it all once you started for applying for chartership with the IET? That's a very good question. I started recording as a PhD student in my first year. So, and, and, and because, and that was just purely because of the process for the PhD. So after your at the end of every first, at the end of every year, you have to demonstrate 30 days worth of CPD. And in the process of putting that together, I started looking back at my undergraduate as well and gathered any certificates, but those were really, really relevant. So I'd say start as soon as you can. So once I started during my PhD, because it's a research, you know, a academic research project, once I started gathering that information there, I just kept it as a habit when I went into the workplace. So for every project I do at the end of the month, I just go over it. What have I learned? What have I, what didn't I understand? I think, I don't know what other institutions have, but the IET have something called IET Career Manager. So it's an online portal where you could keep all records of all the CPDs you've attended and also be able to keep some of these notes as well. So I recommend you, you check that out. Again, I may be biased because I'm an IET member. I only know about their system, but other other um, institutions may have there. So I'd say it's important to start keeping it as you go. And um, when you actually apply for your, your, your CENG or ING, it's usually, I think, five years from the time you're applying. So some of the stuff, like in my first year of my PhD, became redundant because by the time I was applying in 2019, I was looking back up until 2014, not actually anything past that because it wasn't really as relevant as the last five years of the time I had to apply for. So um, definitely start recording as soon as you can is my is my answer to that. Very good advice. Um, so I've got Hannah Burford who said, as someone who is considering doing a PhD, what advice would you give? And Melissa Chigubu, 
who actually I think was one of our We50 winners this year, um, I was always told that if you want to do a PhD, you have to do it full time. It's great hearing that you did it alongside work, but would you recommend having gone through it? And if so, what tips and advice would you give about creating a healthy balance? So a healthy balance and uh, what advice do you give to those thinking about doing it? Um, I'd say if you're thinking about doing a PhD, then I think you should you should at least apply for it and, and follow through to the process because not many people are actually awarded an opportunity to do a PhD. That depends on obviously your funding model. If you're actually funding it yourself or you intend to get um, funding from the university or from an organization. Now I'll just correct, like I actually started mine as a full-time student. The plan was never to do it alongside work. And um, it happened that my funding was for three years. So I did full-time 2011 to 2014, only my PhD. But then obviously I hadn't finished. So I had to get a job to sustain myself because my funding wasn't going to be there for me for the, the years after that. I'd say definitely go through the process because you have to write like a proposal, which means you have to really give it thought about if this is something you really want to do. And um, but I'm always I'm always for it. And um, anybody who wants to go into research, anybody who wants to um, answer questions that haven't yet been found out or figured out yet by by everyone else, even if it's just a niche or very tiny contribution to that bigger picture. But definitely, I say go for it. And um, in terms of like doing it with work, I, I think it's really down to you. I found it very stressful those years of writing up. Um, but that being said, it's because I was on a time scale. So you have to finish at a certain point after you finish the three years of funding. Now, if you go into it from the beginning with a job, for example, I think it's a lot, you get a lot longer time and it's called, I think there's distance learning as well. There's part-time PhDs as well. So that is accounted for with the university and with your employer. But personally, it's not something I would uh, want to do again, just uh, while combining with work. I felt like it was a lot stressful for me and um, in terms of my personal life and everything else. But there are people who have done it and have succeeded at doing both of them. That's brilliant. A question from Kybrith Calder. In what way were you involved with Engineers Without Borders while studying? So while studying, I joined Engineers Without Borders Loughborough and they organized um, events um, where we got to meet engineers without borders from other chapters. I remember going to the Centre for Alternative Technology in Wales, where we got to experience the different types of renewable energy that there is. So wind um, energy, hydro, I remember us we were measuring outside with the civil engineers from, I think it was Nottingham, University of Nottingham, University of Birmingham. So I got to meet other students from other parts, but also we had projects on in Loughborough, so I remember we were working on one as a team, and it's different people from different other departments who are interested in similar things as you are. And we were working on pepper dryers, and I think that the particular year I remember happened to be in Nigeria. So um, farmers harvest pepper in large quantities, and the process for drying is very mundane. So as students, could we come up with some sort of system while thinking about the context of how these local people live and your traditional way of life. It was the first time I saw, rather than me as an engineer coming to tell you, this is the system you need. It was more designing around how those people who intend to use that device actually live. And it, I say it broadened how I, uh, how I started thinking. I wasn't successful in getting any placements. I did apply, but I, I have friends who were successful in the process of applying for placements. I think now with COVID, I don't know if those are still running, but they have like three months placements and six months placements where you actually go out and actually work on these projects. They also have the challenge, engineering challenge design or design challenge, I think is what it's called, where um, students form groups and within their university and work on real life problems that uh, our people are facing in, in different parts of the world. And um, so those are some of the ways you could get involved in, in, in um, Engineers Without Borders. That's brilliant. And I do hope that COVID doesn't stop the fantastic work that Engineers Without Borders is doing. And um, so Sarah Abdul Ahad has asked, as an international student, what advice would you give me when it comes to applying for jobs and sorting out visas? Do you think being an inter international student will affect the chance of getting a graduate job today? And I suspect some of that might have to do with Brexit. We'll have to wait and see. Um, I, I, I not to get political but i i did it's it, it relates to politics when you talk about visas i do know because of brexit 
there have been some reversions back to previous thing and um, should I say visa rules. So don't quote me on this, but um, I think when I came to the UK to study at the time, and um, when an international student finished from their degree, there was something called a post-study visa that lets you work after your degree. It was almost like a given that you'd be able to find work and, and get experience before you then either decide to move back or decide to stay. Um, that was scrapped under Theresa May's government when she was in the home when she was the Home Secretary, and so that was removed when I was graduating. But from the latest updates that I've seen, that it will be coming back again after Brexit because the UK needs those skills and those talents and wants to retain those skills and talents. So I'd say be optimistic, and um, in the sense that there'll be opportunities to apply for it, but obviously it would be on demand because there'll be many people applying for it as it is. I think something I said, and, and something I also told my sisters as well, because my sisters, one of my sisters wasn't able to get a visa and she moved back, but was to also look at opportunities back home as well, while she also looking at opportunities here. Obviously it was really difficult for her. She was un unemployed for like two years after graduating from here, but eventually she found something through the network she was still keeping hold of while she was studying here. So that's something I say, it's not what you want to hear, but I'd say it's a bit more optimistic in the sense that post-study visas are coming back next year. And um, I don't know if they will apply to people already in university now, but you could go ahead and have a look. But still, I think you should always apply. If, if, if the company is on UK borders agency list, then definitely, you're well within your right to apply for that opportunity and just see where it goes. It is challenging, but you just have to try. That's all I can really say, to be honest, on that. Yes, yes, and there's a comment from Nawanti Ten in the in the chat to say there's a new postgraduate visa for students graduating this year, as in 2020, 21, that allows international students to work for two years. Now we've got two more questions left. So I'm going to combine them. Uh, and they are, I'm from Mayu Greenaway Har Harvey, I think her name is. I'm inspired by your work ethic. Do you have any advice for time management and staying motivated? And Kelly Shungu has also said, you have many awards which are very inspiring. Did you apply for the awards yourself or were you nominated by your workplaces? Because that might also, um, if you've got to um, make presentations and uh, apply for awards, that might also affect time management. Yeah, so on time management, I would say I could always be better. Everybody would probably say that. But um, I started, I think when you, I work hardest when I have so much on. And I, during that PhD period where you have to use every single hour of your day, I just had to find a way. But something I've always done, even when I was younger, is um, time boxes. So like an example would be, I don't know if that shows well on camera, probably not. But how we, I, I actually make you could do this on your computer, but I just prefer writing it down. So I have a book that stays. I write down nine till where that is 9.45. This is what I'm doing. And then sometimes that box remains unticked because I am not perhaps motivated to, for example, write a report. Maybe I feel more like crunching the numbers on the spreadsheet instead. And I swap them around. And um, But I try and make sure like, like work time is nine to five and we try and stick to that. Yes, I would say sometimes I have spilled over into other times and um, because I do, I probably enjoy that particular thing I'm working on, but I try not to make that a habit. And in terms of, yeah, in terms of awards, I was nominated for um, a number of them and I had to apply. So I had to apply for the IET's Young Woman Engineer of the Year. And that's one of the key things about the award is that you are putting yourself forward for that opportunity. And then your, award, your application gets an endorser along with it. Um, and so my endorser was uh, Nike from the Association for Black and Minority Eth Ethnic Engineers, Dr. Nike. Um, but I definitely had to apply for that. It doesn't take long, I would say. Um, you just, what something I do, I copy the question out from the actual form and put it in a Word document. And I just make, I print it out and I make notes on it. Like what examples do I think would fit this particular thing? It's the same thing I do for job applications. I don't just type it in. I print it out and think over it. And every time I always use the STAR technique, S-T-A-R. So what was the situation? What was the task? What was the action? What was the result? And it makes it very easy for you to just be able to answer questions around your competence. Give us a time when you've done this. Give us a time when you've done that. Um, and then I also get to check by other people. What do you think about this? So my friends 
my peers or, or sometimes my, my 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 mentor or my line manager and um, i wouldn't say awards take take that much time and um, if you see some that you're interested in as well um feel free to speak to your manager about it so there was some there was one that wasn't like on on our radar or anything somebody else in the IT said oh i saw this award and i think you should apply for it and then i read through it what's involved it says you need somebody to nominate you so i then shared that with my manager I was like I got this um, from a contact at the IET and they think I should apply for this. And I'm hoping you'll be able to write a nomination for me. And I kind of like pester and pester and harass and harass till they write one and then I submit. But yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't personally think awards take that long to apply for. If anything, they're much easier for me than jobs, applying for jobs because it's not do or die. I feel like jobs can feel like do or die sometimes, even though they aren't either. Uh, awards is just putting yourself out there and seeing what comes back sometimes you get yes i've gotten rejections i believe you or not um in, in in the past or um i've 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 not maybe won that particular award but in the process you get to go to like the networking events and you get to meet other people and you need to you get to grow in other aspects of your life not necessarily just your career so like for example some of the ladies i went on with in malawi i am like katie for example i actually met her at the west 50 so the We 50 in 2017. And there are a few other people as well within my network who it was through that particular awards. And we've gone on to collaborate on other things and um, whether it's volunteering within STEM or, or other things in, in like my personal life, basically. So time time management, I'd say there's no fast rule. Um, but I think it's for me something like time boxes. So trying to put things in containers. It doesn't always work. There's yeah, sometimes I still run behind on deadlines and I just have to make up time for it. But um being being organized helps me it's, it's my short answer thank you so much ozak that's been an absolutely fantastic speech and thank you for taking the time to answer all of these questions you've been very very inspiring we now have about five minutes before our next session and alexandra my co-host co -host, is going to explain what happens next thank you very much for having me you're welcome it's been a pleasure And Alex seems to have been uh, kicked out. This is a lovely system. We're having quite a few issues. Uh, basically, what will happen is that when we end this webinar, we will, um, I can see she's trying to come in. Uh, you will be taken back to the landing page and you'll be given an option of two uh, webinars, one of which you can choose. And equally, if you're not happy with that, you can leave and then come back into the other one as well. Uh, so, uh, the next two sessions are going to be how to master your budget with Esther Bangura and Charisma Jane or the application laboratory and sensational CVs with Kim Everett. Um, and uh, they will start at quarter past two. So as I said, we will when we end this webinar, you'll be returned to the um, uh, to the landing page and you can see those two webinars and you can choose which one of the two that you want to go into. What will then happen at the end of that session is we will then, because it's only half an hour, um, you, we will then have another session of online interviews, top tips, and simultaneously running with leadership and personal brand. Uh, and uh, then there will be a 15 minute break at that point. So again, you can choose whichever session you wish to go into. And again, if you find it's not entirely to your liking, you can switch to the other session. But each time you'll be bounced back to the uh, landing page to choose your next session. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to Ozak for a really, truly inspiring speech. And we look forward to seeing you in the next sessions.